Taylor Abel. I'm a, uh, I'm a uh, pediatric neurosurgeon at uh, Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Um, I'm going to talk about neuromodulation. Um, originally, this session had two neurosurgeon speakers that were going to talk about neuromodulation. Uh, I was going to give an overview, and then uh, Dr. Bolo from Utah was going to talk about RNS after hemispherotomy. Unfortunately, he had some professional responsibilities come up. He had, he's taking call right now. And so I'm actually talking about both of those things. Um, I'm going to talk for as long as I need to, but I don't think it's going to take up the amount of time that we're scheduled to talk. And so what I'm really hoping is that I can talk for a while, and um, then we can just kind of have a discussion about these different neuromodulation therapies. Um, so, okay, so that, that's where I work. I, I'm from Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. I'm a neurosurgeon. I'm also um, in the de Department of Bioengineering. Um, I, do, I do maybe 80 neuromodulation procedures every year. Um, so I do, I do a lot of neuromodulation surgery. Um, and uh, these are my... These are my disclosures. I have research funding from NIH, uh, NSF, PCORI, and then I'm also funded by Monteris Medical, which is a laser ablation company. I do have one slide on laser ablation in this talk, um, but, but mostly we're talking about neuromodulation. Um, I also do some consulting for different companies. Those are my disclosures. Um, and, and so I, I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon. That's my clinical job. My, my research, I do about 50% research. Um, and my lab mostly does auditory cognitive neuroscience. Obviously, I'm not going to talk about that today. But my other big interest is what we call comparative effectiveness research. And that's really important in epilepsy surgery right now because what that is is when we take two different strategies to treat a problem, and then we compare those strategies to try to figure out what the best way of dealing with it is. In a particular setting where we can't or it's difficult to do standard randomized control trials. And neuromodulation is a really important example of that because we don't have great randomized clinical trials in neuromodulation. and It's actually probably not possible to do them well. Um, and so that's one of my big interests. And I'm particularly interested in something called decision analysis, which is where you don't even have great data because there are really broad ranges of outcomes when you're using different neuromodulation strategies. But decision analysis is something where we can take two strategies and simulate what it would be like for an individual patient to have that strategy used. I'll talk about that a little bit, but that's what my research is. Um, please don't try to memorize or read any of these slides. For example, there are tables and pictures, and these slides are mostly meant to prompt um, discussion or for me to make certain points. Also, all this is being uh, recorded on video, so you can always go back and read it or look at it later. Um, ask plenty of questions. I think it's actually okay if you want to raise your hand and interrupt me to ask a question. Um, when you ask a question, I'll restate your questions so that they get, get it on the recording, and, um, and then we'll keep going. I think we have like plenty of time. I always talk faster when I'm in front of people, uh, so I, I'm not going to talk for 40 minutes, and we'll have plenty of time for questions, plenty of time for interruptions. Um, this is what I'm going to talk about. First, we're going to talk about what neuromodulation is, in a very broad sense, as a strategy in epilepsy surgery. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the different forms of neuromodulation that are used in epilepsy. Um, we're going to really just briefly touch on combining different neuromodulation strategies or when to use certain neuromodulation strategies. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about combining resection and neuromodulation or what it might look like to, say, use neuromodulation after, say, a hemispherotomy. Um, and then we'll briefly discuss, discuss uh, dis decision making. Um, there's no right or wrong answer here, but, but I'm kind of hoping that we prompt some discussion and we can kind of talk through things.
Um, first big question, when should you, and, and originally this, this talk was called, when should you consider neuromodulation? And, um, and I actually think this is pretty straightforward. I think you should start thinking about neuromodulation or any type of epilepsy surgery when, you're, when your child or your family member has what's called drug-resistant epilepsy. And, and what, that, what that means is that once you've been on two adequate trials of two anti-seizure medications, um, we know that there's only about a 5% chance that adding a third medication or trialing a third medication will result in seizure freedom, and that's when we should start thinking about epilepsy surgery strategies. And so sometimes epilepsy surgery is really straightforward. There's a brain tumor, or there's a very specific part of the brain where we see a, an abnormality on an MRI that we can target with a resective surgery. And it's even more straightforward if that area doesn't involve what we call eloquent brain, like that's motor cortex or language cortex. And in that case, we do resective surgery. And sometimes that involves a hemispherotomy. Um, but when those aren't options, uh, neuromodulation should be considered. And when to refer is the same as it would be for resective surgery. Um, and this is, uh, this is a, a recently published consensus statement that, that uh, is, it provides some evidence for what I just said from, from these global experts on, uh, on epilepsy surgery. Um, and so broadly, what are the different types of, of uh, neuromodulation in epilepsy surgery? The one that's probably been around the longest is something called vagus nerve stimulation. We're going to go over what that is. Um, another one that's been around for a long time is uh, deep brain stimulation. And then the third that's, that's more recent, but we have a lot of data for, is responsive neurostimulation. And so I'm going to kind of go over what all three of those are. We're going to talk about it and, um, and talk about it when it's used in different contexts. So, Vagus nerve stimulation, raise your hand if you've heard of vagus nerve stimulation. So almost everyone in the room, I'm, I'm glad that Dr. Perry's heard of it too, so I'm glad to see his hand would go up. Um, and so this is, this is what it is. And so very broadly, what neuromodulation is, is we are using a stimulator to change the brain's activity to try to reduce the number or severity of seizures. That's what neuromodulation is very broadly. Typically, it's done with invasive stimulators, which we're going to talk about today. What we're not going to talk about today, because I'm not an expert, is there are also some non-invasive ways to, for example, stimulate the vagus nerve. For example, you can stimulate the earlobe or sometimes put a wrap around the neck. Um, those have not been found to be real effective for epilepsy yet, but those are some other things people are starting to think about. Vagus nerve stimulation, what this is, is we are trying to change the activity in a part of the brain called the thalamus through stimulating the vagus nerve, which is a nerve in the neck. And this is a picture of what it looks like. Here's the vagus nerve, and it's, there's this pulse generator. You can see my mouse. Yeah. Uh, and these leads that are implanted in the neck and wrap around the nerve. And so a couple of details about the procedure. This is not brain surgery. So this, it is neck surgery. And what we do is we make an opening in the neck. We do a very standardized straightforward uh, opening down to the vagus nerve. Um, we place these leads on the vagus nerve, and then we make an opening uh, right underneath the clavicle where we place a, a pulse generator, which is just a fancy word for a battery. The leads get hooked up to the battery, and then the surgery's done. Um, takes us about 45 minutes, uh, some, sometimes up to an hour and a half, but usually about 45 minutes to do the whole surgery. It has a low complication rate. Um, probably the most important complication to think about is infection. Uh, because we're implanting a device, it has about a 3 to 5% risk of infection. The reason infection is really important to talk about uh, with this procedure is because if it does get infected and it's a deep infection, the device has to be removed. And the reason that's important to consider is removing these devices is actually more difficult than putting them in. And so it's a bigger, if, if it does get infected, um, it's a, it's a bigger surgery to remove the device than it is to put it in. And the reason that's important is because when you initially place the device, the rate of complications is, is quite low, 
But when we see complications like difficulty swallowing or permanent hoarse voice, things like that after this procedure, it's typically after we've had to revise the leads due to an infection. So the rate of these things happening, really low, but when these complications do happen, they can be uh, sometimes serious. So we have a lot of observational and some randomized clinical trial data on the effectiveness of vagus nerve stimulation. Um, this is one of the most cited meta-analyses um, that was written by Dar Dario Inglo, who's an adult neurosurgeon who's now at Vanderbilt and does a lot of epilepsy surgery. And, um, and this is just a plot that is, a, this is a meta-analysis that shows the range of effectiveness in decreasing seizures across all these different studies. And what's really important to note, you don't have to understand this completely, but what's really important to note is that you see a huge range of effectiveness in these different studies. And what that probably reflects is that these, these studies are including a broad range of different types of patients. And so um, though a lot of the randomized controlled trials for vagus nerve stimulation have been for partial epilepsy, um, at least in my own practice, we're mostly using it for generalized epilepsy when resective surgery is not an option. And so one thing that's, been, that's helpful from this meta-analysis is it compares partial and generalized epilepsy. And what's really interesting is that the effectiveness in generalized epilepsy in this meta-analysis actually seems to be um, there's a higher rate of having a response than for partial epilepsy. Yeah, go ahead. That's a great question. So, for example, if seizures were localized to language cortex in someone that had normal language function, that might be a situation where you would consider vagus nerve stimulation for someone with partial epilepsy. Or similarly, if you have motor cortex epilepsy, you might consider vagus nerve stimulation in someone with normal motor function um, as a way of reducing seizure uh, frequency in someone who has a focal epilepsy, but you don't want to remove that part of the brain for functional reasons. Um, and then more often, it's someone who comes to my clinic with generalized epilepsy where there's just not a resection option because the seizures are coming from everywhere. Does that answer your question? And I forgot to restate the question, so I'm going to do that now. The question is, what would be, what, what would be the indication for vagus nerve stimulation in someone with partial epilepsy. Is that right? OK. Um, this, is a, this is a more recent systematic review and meta-analysis that was published in Neurology, which is a, another high-impact journal that's looking specifically at uh, pediatric epilepsy. But um, the, the spiel I typically give families is that there's a 50% chance of 50% seizure reduction with a vagus nerve stimulator, and this meta-analysis reinforces that. So the response rate here is about 50% um, when they did the sim a similar type of meta-analysis, including only pediatric papers. Um, and so recently, vagus nerve stimulator, uh, Levanova has come out with these um, heart rate responsive vagus nerve stimulators. And, and the idea here is that uh, seizures are associated with change in, change in heart, uh, heart rate, and uh, particularly heart rate acceleration is a biomarker for seizures. And, um, and this device actually detects when there's a change in heart rate and then will deliver stimulation specifically in response to heart rate changes. And so um, we did a retrospective observational study using our own data where we show that after two years, there seems to be a increased response rate using these heart rate responsive vagus nerve stimulators compared to traditional vagus nerve stimulation. Um, and then patients who have generalized epilepsy, particularly, particularly atonic seizures, are often considering even either vagus nerve stimulation or another surgical procedure called corpus callosotomy. Corpus callosotomy is when we take one of the seven connections between the two hemispheres and we disconnect it. And it's not, a, it's not neuromodulation, but I thought it fit to talk about here um, because oftentimes uh, folks who are considering uh, 
who have atonic seizures or drop attack seizures are considering one of these two strategies. This is a meta-analysis um, that's highly cited by Guido Lankman that shows that um, for these atonic types of seizures, corpus callosotomy is much more effective. So there's probably about a 70% chance that your drop attack seizures will, um, will go away if you have a corpus callosotomy and about a 20% chance if you use vagus nerve stimulation. Now, at the same time, this is a bigger procedure. Um, but what we've begun to do in recent years is um, use a laser ablation approach to perform corpus callosotomy so that we can perform a callosotomy with, uh, without doing a craniotomy. And so this is an example of how we do that. This is the corpus callosum here. And we place these small laser ablation probes into the corpus callosum using this robot. You can see the, uh, the anchor bolts placed here that guide the laser ablation probe into the corpus callosum. Um, and then we're able to perform a callosotomy that way. And, and that can be a way of, another way of treating drop attack seizures. Um, I've used decision analysis to compare these two approaches, which shows that even when you account for the complications and the effectiveness of these two approaches, vagus nerve stimulation and corpus callosotomy, corpus callosotomy is a more effective approach, but it's not as cost effective. And so um, vagus nerve stimulation, even though it's less effective, it might make sense, at least from a cost effectiveness standpoint, to try that first um, before considering a corpus callosotomy. Anyway, um, any questions about any of that? So now I'm going to talk about deep brain stimulation. Um, deep brain stimulation is similar to vagus nerve stimulation in that we are changing the activity in a part of the brain called the thalamus. Um, but rather than placing an electrode in the neck, Deep brain stimulation works by us implanting electrodes directly into the thalamus itself or other brain regions. And so this is what it, what it looks like when electrodes are implanted in the brain. These electrodes have to be implanted with exquisite accuracy. Um, and so to do this procedure, we often place the head in a special frame called the stereotactic frame. And then um, we use that frame. Either the frame has an attachment that gives us really this great accuracy or we use a stereotactic robot to then place electrodes into these deep brain structures uh, to treat uh, seizures. Deep brain stimulation is a little bit different than responsive neurostimulation, which I'll be talking about in subsequent slides, in that it stimulates at a regular schedule. So rather than responding to the seizures, it stimulates at regular intervals throughout the day, programmed by often a neurologist, sometimes a neurosurgeon, uh, to treat seizures. And so deep brain stimulation very broadly is just a technique or a method for stimulating the brain. But, but really the treatment is which part of the brain you're stimulating and how often you're stimulating it. And there are a lot of different targets that have different pros and cons that we can target with these electrodes. So for example, with uh, seizures that are coming from the bilateral frontal lobes, or have are more broad, say in generalized epilepsy, we often target a part of the thalamus that has really broad connectivity called the central median nucleus of the thalamus. Um, if seizures are coming from the temporal lobes or a part of the brain called the limbic system, then we target either the hippocampus or the anterior thalamic nucleus, which are both part of this limbic network in the brain. And then previously, though it's not done much anymore. Um, neurosurgeons used to place electrodes in a part of the brain called the cerebellum, which is the back part of the brain. Um, subthalamic nucleus has also been used um, in also other brain regions. But these are really the, the three most important targets are probably central median nucleus in either hippocampal or anterior thalamic. Recently, there's been a lot of interest in trying to develop better strategies for treating lennox gastaut type epilepsy. So this is a really severe form of generalized epilepsy. And so John Archer has led a clinical trial um, in Australia um, where 
patients with Lennox Gusteau are randomized to either having um, they they all get the deep brain stimulation surgery where they have the electrodes implanted, and then patients after waiting three months are randomized to either having the stimulator device turned on or not having it turned on. And patients are not made aware of which group they're in. The reason why it's really important to wait three months before turning the device on in a clinical trial like this is sometimes just placing an electrode into the centromedian nucleus of the thalamus has some benefit for seizures. It's something in functional neurosurgery we call a lesion effect. And so if somebody has a tremor, an essential tremor, just me placing an electrode into the uh, anterior thalamus can make the tremor go away temporarily. And it has, there's a similar effect with epilepsy. And so that's why you're probably wondering why didn't they turn the device on right away. And that's the reason why. They wanted to let things settle down so that they could really distinguish the effect of having the stimulator turned on from this lesion effect. Um, and so what you see in this trial is that if you compare the patients who had no stimulation to the patients that had uh, stimulation, um, either in changes on the seizure diary or changes on ambulatory EEG, um, you see a decrease in seizure frequency with, uh, in these patients with lennox gusto uh, type epilepsy with centromedian uh, stimulation. Um, this is a meta-analysis that looks at uh, DBS of the anterior thalamus, centromedian nucleus, and hippocampus. And the upshot, so this takes all the literature, combines it together, and synthesizes it. And DBS of the anterior thalamic nucleus is associated with a 60% rate of 50% seizure reduction. Centromedian nucleus, a 73% rate of 50% seizure reduction. And... Um, and uh, hippocampus, 67%. Um, and so these are, have probably higher rates of responsiveness than we would think of for, say, vagus nerve stimulation. Um, we have also used centromedian DBS in emergent uh, catastrophic epilepsy. So this is a patient who had something called fire syndrome, who was, um, who was in the hospital in a... Um, for over a month, having really severe seizures. Um, and these are situations where we're willing to try almost every, anything to get the seizures under control. Um, after trying just about every medical approach we had, we placed a vagus nerve stimulator, which did not have an impact uh, for this particular patient. And then we placed these electrodes in the uh, centromedian nucleus of the thalamus, and, um, and she kind of had this near miraculous response. Um, where her seizures uh, came under better control quite quickly, and, and she also was able to wake up um, from her coma. So centromedia nucleus is actually also a target for uh, patients who have disorders of consciousness. So this is, uh, there are some other clinical trials in other fields where we're taking patients who aren't able to wake up from uh, comas. Other centers are doing this. And this is also the target for... Um, for in those studies. And so there's maybe some effect on not just seizures, but also arousal level. Um, combining different neuromodulation strategies may have some positive effects. Um, these are not worked out. Um, well, this is a paper really that mostly shows that people are doing this. It doesn't really show too much of an effect, but um, this particular study, there were eight patients treated with VNS and DBS, or six patients treated with VNS and RNS, and there seemed to be a higher proportion of patients responding when they were being stimulated simultaneously using these different strategies. This is like really early anecdotal evidence, but I think we're going to learn more about this in coming years, uh, especially as more data emerges. Um, and, and I'm going to go on now to talk about responsive neurostimulation. Any questions about any of this so far? Um, go ahead, yeah. 
I'm going to restate your question. Let me know if I got this right. So I think the question is, how, how often are you deciding to use VNS or DBS? And how do you make that decision? So I think this decision is still, um, at least at our center, and I can't speak for every center, but at least at our center, we typically will start with VNS because families are more comfortable with it. Um, there's a lot of data, and, and with less data with DBS, sometimes we, we kind of talk about, especially in children, since I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon, there's a little bit less evidence. Now, that said, we also talk about the pros and cons. And um, so I would say I do, I do about 50 VNS surgeries a year. I probably do, if you were to combine RNS and DBS, I maybe do 15 surgeries a year. And so I think VNS is still, at least in my own practice, still utilized much more. But, uh, but I think the landscape will change in the coming years and we'll probably use these other strategies more and more. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. So post hemispherectomy and hysterotomy is sort of transitions. Should DBS be considered an option um, with or without the bowel mass, so in some cases the bowel mass is more sensitive? So the question is, should DBS be considered after hemispherotomy? At return seizures after hemispherotomy. And that's something I'm, uh, we're actually gonna, I actually have some slides on using. And I think, the, so we're gonna talk about that a little bit more later, but I think the answer is yes. And that's because, for example, if the seizures are, and I think it depends on a few things. One is we know that 30 to 40% of patients who have hemispherotomy need revision surgery because of residual connections. Sometimes patients will then have an anatomic hemispherectomy that removes all of the residual tissue, so there's no chance of seizures coming from that side. Particularly in those situations, we, we know that the seizures are coming from the remaining uh, more normal hemisphere. And in that situation, um, centromedian DBS may be useful because it would modulate the activity very broadly in that remaining hemisphere if you targeted the remaining centromedian nucleus of the thalamus. And so actually the responsive neurostimulation case that I'll show later that's from Saadi Gatan's group um, in New York um, is an example of that using RNS. Any other questions right now? Checking the time, okay. So now I'm gonna talk about responsive neurostimulation and then we can have some further discussion. So responsive neurostimulation is a, is a neuromodulation modality that can involve placing electrodes on the surface of the brain or deep in the brain, similar to DBS, but what distinguishes responsive neurostimulation from deep brain stimulation is that rather than scheduled stimulation, this stimulation occurs in response to recorded neural activity. So there's one electrode in the brain that's recording neural activity and another electrode in the brain that is stimulating in response to it. Um, and this is an example of what the device looks like. You can use cortical strip electrodes or these depth electrodes that go deeper in the brain. And then these electrodes are connected to a pulse generator that is usually implanted in the skull, though in young children it can also be implanted underneath the clavicle similar to a, a DBS electrode or a VNS um, pulse generator. Um, so this is often what it looks like. The procedural details are similar to deep brain stimulation when we're placing electrodes deeper into the brain. Um, some RNS electrodes are placed on the cortical surface. This can either be done through placing a really small hole in the skull or a small craniotomy, which is a larger opening. Um, RNS pulse generators, the battery is typically implanted through a small window in the skull. This thing has a mind of its own. Um, and, uh, and the pulse generator usually has to be revised every eight to 10 years. Whereas uh, VNS batteries, um, it's more on average about every five years. Um, and then also with battery changes for DBS, um, usually in children, it's, uh, I use rechargeable batteries for DBS, so it's um, 
they'll, they'll, they'll mostly be adults by the time they get battery changes, but it's every 15 years if you have a rechargeable battery. Um, so there are different modalities that we'll talk a little bit about for RNS or typical ways that it's used. One is when epilepsy involves both of the temporal lobes, we sometimes place electrodes in the, the hippocampus on both sides of the brain. And the reason we do this is because we can't safely remove both temporal lobes. In fact, one of the most pa uh, famous uh, patients in neuroscience is a patient named H.M. who had both of his temporal lobes removed. And the reason he's so famous is because he wasn't able to form memories afterwards. And so that's why we, if you remove both your temporal lobes, memory is a really serious issue. And so that's why this gives us a way of treating these types of epilepsies that we would not have been able to treat um, with res traditional resective surgery. Though this approach can be combined with surgery, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, if we have multiple areas of the brain, it's focal epilepsy, but it's multifocal epilepsy because there are multiple focuses, we can use RNS electrodes if those are areas that can't be removed. And then also there's something called regional RNS, which is where RNS is used to stimulate over a broad region of the brain, and I'll show an example of that also. So we now have really long-term uh, data for RNS that shows that the longer you use it, probably the more effective it becomes at reducing your seizures. And so um, this is nine-year data in uh, over 100 patients, about 150 patients, showing up to 70% seizure frequency reduction. And you can see that that's increased from three-year follow-up data. Um, and so this, this can be a really effective method for focal epilepsy where we can't remove uh, the brain for some reason, whether it involves language cortex or it's too many regions of the brain that can't safely be removed or, motor fun or it involves motor function. And so RNS, another advantage of RNS is that it can also be combined with resective surgery. Um, and not only can it be combined with resective surgery, but it can also give us information about treatment response because it doesn't just stimulate the brain, it also records the brain. And so in patients with what's called bitemporal epilepsy, this is this example where epilepsy involves both the temporal lobes. The traditional strategy used to be that we would bring someone with bitemporal epilepsy into the hospital, we would implant electrodes into the, both their temporal lobes, and we would watch how many seizures they had over a period of one to two weeks. And then if all the seizures, if 60% if or more of the seizures came from one side, we would remove that side of the brain. Now, that was the best we could do at that time, but the problem with that is, is that a lot of things can happen when you start recording after longer than two weeks. So if you record for, say, a year, it might be that even though uh, maybe the left temporal lobe was having a bad week that week, and was just having more seizures, and the right temporal lobe was not. But if you record for a year, it might be that you see a different pattern of involvement between the two sides of the brain. And so by implanting electrodes into the temporal lobes for a longer period of time and letting people return to their normal activities, we can get a better idea of which temporal lobe is more involved in the epilepsy and then what this paper shows is that after recording for 12 months and figuring out which temporal lobe is more affected, you can then go back and remove that temporal lobe that was shown to be the primary culprit based on the RNS recordings. And so what this paper shows is that if the RNS shows that only one temporal lobe is involved in this particular study that looked at nine patients, there was a 100% rate of seizure freedom at one year after removing that temporal lobe. And so, um, so RNS doesn't just have therapeutic value, it also helps us figure out exactly where seizures are coming from. Um, responsive neurostimulation can also be used in a regional way. This is where electrodes are placed, kind of, um, this, this is for epilepsy that involves a larger or regional onset in the brain that perhaps we don't want to remove. And so RNS electrodes are implanted uh, 
further away from each other than they might normally be, and then they're used to stimulate across these larger areas of the brain. So this is called res uh, regional responsive neurostimulation. And um, this is a paper from uh, three different groups, Mount Sinai, UCSF, and Alabama, showing that you have, um, I keep doing that, showing that you have, in some patients, these really great responses using this strategy, in some cases up to 100% um, um, seizure reduction. Though there are clearly also some non-responders here where this didn't work out. So RNS can also be used to um, modulate activity in parts of the brain that are deeper down in subcortical nuclei. And so connectivity of these regions, like we were talking about with deep brain stimulation, determines where we're going to place electrodes. Um, and kind of like we were talking about before, um, we can place electrodes in the central median nucleus when it's the bi bifrontal or a more generalized epilepsy, anterior thalamic nucleus when it's bitemporal or limbic, and then um, if it's the parietal or occipital lobe, some groups have placed electrodes in a part of the brain called the pulvenar. Um, and this is an example of what that looks like. Um, this is a patient who uh, they had generalized epilepsy and they had kind of read about both RNS and VNS and were interested in pursuing RNS. Um, and so we placed electrodes in this small part of the brain called the central median nucleus. You can see what the electrodes look like here and the pulse generators implanted kind of in the skull right next to where the electrodes go into the brain. This patient had a 50% uh, seizure reduction at their last follow-up. Um, using responsive neurostimulation for generalized epilepsy is a pretty new concept and there's not a lot of data right now. This is um, data from Mark Richardson's group at Mass General. He used to be my partner uh, on the adult side at, at uh, University of Pittsburgh. But what he shows is that this is an approach you can use for, um, for idiopathic generalized epilepsy. Um, that uh, in, in this smaller series, there's a 100% response rate, meaning everybody had some type of improvement. And in this series, there were also patients that had a period of time where they were seizure-free for a while, which um, for these patients was really, really meaningful, even though it was not permanent. Um, now I'm going to talk about combining RNS with different resection strategies. Um, so you can combine resective surgery with RNS. For example, if you have a, someone who has seizures that start in motor cortex and also premotor cortex, one strategy that people have begun using is removing the premotor cortex because it's safe to do that without causing a deficit and then placing a stimulator on the motor cortex since that's something that we, we cannot safely remove without causing a deficit. Um, similar groups have used this approach with language cortex and also with visual cortex. Um, there's not a lot that has been published on this yet, though we know that people are doing it because this is, um, this is data from UCSF, and here they had eight patients who had that particular strategy um, actually 10 patients who had that particular strategy used, though they don't discuss the outcomes in detail in this paper. So I think outcomes are pending. We'll kind of sort that out in the coming years. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about that a lot of people are now talking about, but um, to my knowledge, there are only two patients in the country that have had this done, is using RNS after hemispherotomy or hemispherectomy. The idea here is that a certain proportion of hemispherectomy failures are due to seizures coming from the more normal hemisphere, um, the contralateral side. And so the strategy here is to then place RNS electrodes over the remaining side and using RNS stimulation to treat those remaining seizures. Um, and so uh, Sadi Gatan, who's a neurosurgeon at Mount Sinai, um, was very gracious to share um, these pictures with me. This is one of two cases I'm, patients I'm aware of in the country that's had this done. Um, this is a patient who had a hemispherotomy, a periinsular hemispherotomy on one side, 
Seizures were later found to be coming from the other side. And then uh, after two years of seizure freedom, after the hemispherotomy, uh, and then RNS strips were then placed on the frontal region on the remaining side. That uh, led to a 50% seizure reduction, um, but, but we, they, they wanted to get a better seizure frequency reduction. And so what they did was rather than relying on the scalp EEG, they then went back and performed a stereo EEG, meaning they implanted electrodes to record directly from the remaining hemisphere. This is um, what the stereo EEG electrodes look like. Uh, they then were able to put place more target electrodes, including a subcortical electrode in the central median nucleus to get to what you were bringing up earlier, um, which they found um, to be more helpful and was eventually, at this time, uh, this patient has a 75% uh, seizure fre frequency reduction with this strategy. Um, so there are so many different options right now that making decisions can be really difficult. Um, I think one thing that's really important to do is to discuss the pros and cons of each of these approaches with, uh, with your doctor. I think it can also be helpful to get a second opinion, um, particularly if you have unanswered questions. Um, and, and I think it's also really important to do what is most makes the most sense to you and your family um, because there are different pros and cons and we don't have, for some of these newer approaches, we don't have great data. And as you can imagine, what many families with epilepsy, epilepsy is such a diverse condition that what many of us are going through is something that can't be accounted for in a regular clinical trial. Uh, clinical trials take very standard types of patients and put them through a very standard type of treatment. And, um, and it can be really tough for that reason to make decisions about rare conditions using these traditional types of clinical trials. And so I think it's really important to discuss the pros and cons very thoroughly, um, talk to other families that have been through the same thing uh, or something similar, and then make the decision that's best for you and your family. Um, what is the way forward? So I think clinical trials, even though I just knocked clinical trials, um, <laughs> clinical trials, clinical trials have a really important role, um, and uh, there are there's a really important role for industry-funded clinical trials, really important role for NIH-funded clinical trials. Um, RNS, for example, has a number of clinical trials that are going on right now to investigate uh, responses to generalized epilepsy pediatric multifocal epilepsy. Um, like we talked about earlier, these comparative effectiveness studies that don't randomize patients but are able to use special analysis tools to compare different treatment strategies can be really important, including decision analysis. Um, so I think those are potential ways forward, but, um, but, but none of these things are easy and um, Go ahead. Yeah, question. Yeah, I, I tried. I have two questions. Um, kind of linking together. Not if it's um, in the list. Um, when you personally are presenting me, these different options versus a resection or corpus callosotomy or whatever other surgery is, is on the table. With the with the families, how do you approach the side effects to each other? Because the efficacy side is, is often talked about in this very common. Yeah, that, that's, um, we, we don't just talk about effectiveness. In fact, when I'm talking about a corpus callosotomy with a family, believe me, the effectiveness conversation is straightforward because that is a straightforward, like we know that one is much more effective than the other. What is much more complicated is talking about the side effects because with corpus callosotomy, um, as, you, as you know, um, there are some patients that go home one day after the procedure is done, and there are others that have a, a short stay in rehab. And so uh, long term, many of these patients do well and, and have improved quality of life, but um, it's a much longer discussion because we don't just have to talk about what some of the risks are, but we also have to talk about how you deal with those things and what the recovery is like 
And um, so we have to talk about these things holistically. That's a really good point. Hey, good to see you. So this is a great question. That so the, I'm going to restate the question, which I forgot to do with your question. Sorry, but um, so the question is, do we have to localize the focus before doing RNS after a hemispherotomy? In any case, so um, I think the answer is it depends. And so um, if if an EEG, a non-invasive EEG, shows a really broad onset that looks kind of generalized. Um, and I think we'll just we'll place an electrode into the central median nucleus because we think that's what would happen. We, we think that's best because it's not very well localized on the non-invasive studies. But um, what we've done in other situations, we want to know exactly where those seizures are starting so that we can place the electrodes in the most targeted way possible. And so... Um, Invasive monitoring with, with these types of SEG electrodes give us a way of safely doing that. Um, and so I think it depends on the target. If the target is going to be the cortex, I think, uh, I think SEG or some other type of invasive monitoring strategy can be really helpful for figuring out exactly where to place the electrodes. But again, I think it's also one of these discussions with the family where um, you have to talk about the risk of each of these incremental steps, and then also um, very much just discussing with the family what this would be like to go through and what they're what they're willing to do. Can, and I think it depends on where they're at, also, and how severe things are. Yeah. There must be some. So the question is, the question is, Kristen Riley did a great job on these RNS implantations. She's a neurosurgeon at UAB because all these patients have a 100% um, seizure frequency reduction. Um, and and it, so it must be, you think it must be something like that. But, but the problem with these types of observational studies is that in epilepsy being such a diverse condition, there's always this kind of bias. And, and we, we can't answer these questions retrospectively without looking at all these different covariates that could influence their outcome. Um, and so it, it, probably has, it probably has something to do with patient selection, um, probably has something to do also with the electrodes being in the right spot, definitely, because if they're in the wrong spot, this wouldn't happen. But, um, but it probably isn't random because um, because we don't see uh, because we know that these patients have drug resistant epilepsy and um, and there's only a five percent chance of becoming seizure free. So if you look at the uh, the, the probability of becoming seizure free after VNS is five percent. That is the odds of becoming seizure free with drug resistant epilepsy. So that probably is chance. But the um, but but something like this probably has to do with selection bias. And, and we would need more numbers to know for sure. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, I imagine our case is, is unique, as every parent in whose case is unique. So um, in, the, in the stereo EEG timeline, is that a process that takes weeks, months? First of all, that's the first question. And then go on from there. So um, when we do stereo EEG, there's, there's of course planning and scheduling, and, um, but, but usually, I think it depends on which center you're at, the electrodes are usually placed for about a week, sometimes two weeks. It's probably safe to have them there for two to three weeks. The longest I've ever had electrodes in, some, in someone's brain, and it was when I was in training at Iowa, was five weeks. 
So that's that's probably that's pretty long. Um, and then to accomplish that, say someone typically has seizures once a month or, or less, we typically wean medications before bringing someone into the EMU to do the SCG because our goal isn't isn't to go to two weeks. Our goal is let's get some seizures in a couple days and, and get the electrodes out as soon as we can. Because for young children, it can be really difficult to have these electrodes in place. Um, so the, the SCG usually takes about a week of being in the hospital. And then for the intervention afterwards, there are two different approaches. Um, for RNS, there are some programs that will still wait six weeks between an SCG and placing an RNS with the idea that if there was an infection from an SCG, you would want to make sure you knew about that before doing RNS. But, um, but, but my experience and some experience of other people I work closely with is that uh, it's pretty safe just to do the RNS right away afterwards. Um, and so that's typically what we do, either when the SCG electrodes are removed or just whenever it's convenient for the family afterwards. But, but every center's a little bit different. Yeah, so a follow-up question to that. In our situation where hemispherotomy, revision for hemispherotomy and then laser ablation, and it's still not seizure-free. So um, we're, we think that the seizures are coming from that same side. Is that something where RNS would be beneficial for? Because everything that you've presented thus far is for generalized both sides or for just the uh, unaffected side. And our uh, initial diagnosis was HME, and here they're infected. So. I, think, I think it depends on a lot of details. Right. Um, <laughs> and maybe, maybe we could talk later on. But, um, but I think if there's some residual connection on that uh, side, and for some reason you couldn't remove it, then you could theoretically place an RNS electrode there. But I, think, but I think if it's coming from the same side, then the approach we often think about is trying to disconnect that remaining tissue. Um, and really reserving RNS for something that can't be disconnected, like being on the other side, something like that. Especially after, if you've had the hemispherotomy before, because a lot of the morbidity from a hemispherotomy comes from that first surgery. If, if when that first surgery is done, that's when you lose the visual function, the motor function, language function, depending on what side it is. Um, and so, and that's why we tend to be fairly aggressive with revision hemispherotomy surgeries because a lot of the morbidity is, is up front with that first surgery. And so I, I think it depends on a lot of details, but, um, we discuss later on if that'd be helpful. Do you have centers that you suggest um, have this on? Would it be really broader centers in the EMU where you talk about terminals that we're thinking of? I think there are there are a lot of places that are doing things like this. Um, I think it kind of depends on where where you are. Um, I think it is good to go as locally as you can because the RNS also involves um, some programming and monitoring, if, if we're talking about RNS. Um, VNS, you can go almost anywhere. There's a lot of experience at almost every center with, with VNS. D DBS and RNS, I think there's a little bit more, it's a little bit more selective, but, but I think what I would do is just be really upfront with your local group and say, where would you recommend going? And, um, and then, uh, and, and if they say, well, you should stay here, then the next thing you can ask is, how many of these do you do a year? <laughs> and, um, and, and it doesn't have to be a big number, but you want it to be like a double digit number. Um, like, like, uh, like one a month or 10 a year, that's, that's enough to really know how to do RNS or DBS. Um, and, uh, and I think there's certain, there's, there are a lot of centers that have that experience now. Um, we could, I could give you a few ideas later. Depending, we could talk about where you live, and I can give you a few ideas. <laughs> yeah, they have a lot of really good experience at UAB. Go ahead. 
I think so, yes. So I can't restate the entire question, yeah, but I, <laughs> I think the question is, I think the question is, first of all, it's a great comment that VNS has other effects other than seizure control. And I didn't talk about that stuff today because I'm not an expert, but I work actually work with a few people that are experts. And the bottom line is that these different methods do other things than just seizure control that can be related to controlling the interictal activity in the brain, so the activity in the brain between seizures, um, which we know is like an independent risk factor for having a lower IQ, and we know if is associated with like having difficulty recalling a word or encoding a memory if it's time locked to certain um, cognitive tasks. So like. Uh, changing that activity is, can be really important, and it sounds like you've seen that firsthand. Um, and uh, like, like, uh, or like the centromedian case I showed earlier. Like, you know, as surgeons, we always show like our best outcomes, right? And but this is, this is one of mine because this was a this was a, a young woman that was in a coma for a month. She like woke up. You know, it was like it was like amazing, and like came to my clinic and she goes to high school now and I mean this changed her life and and so the bottom line is that these neurostimulators can do other things so VNS is also there are some clinical trials for depression and and so there, there are other parts of the brain that, that affect there's an investigator at Pitt Bharat uh, Chandrasekharan who um, studies how it influences um, phoneme encoding so how the brain encodes different speech sounds, and you can learn these speech sounds better with, the, with vagus nerve stimulation. And so there are other effects on the brain, um, which we didn't really cover today, but, but yes, absolutely. And also having the seizures under better control potentially could also have that effect. Would definitely have, would, would, would be likely to have that effect. Well, she's had more seizures than she's had it, but ah, okay. <laughs> oddly enough. So um, did this session end at five minutes ago? Sorry about that. <laughs> so uh, I, <laughs> this talk's the only reason I'm here. So uh, if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to ask me afterwards. Send me, send me an email. My email address is not here, but it's easy to find on the internet. If you use Google, Google my name, Taylor Abel, and uh, my email address is on my profile at Pitt. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, and thanks, thanks for your attention. Uh, I hope it was not boring. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, let me know.